Please turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and I'll read the entire chapter today. What am I what I'm about to read to you doesn't become the word of God as the lights go on in your head or as it becomes meaningful to you what I'm about to read to you is the word of God it's authoritative it is for you God's people please give careful attention to it as it is read my little children These things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. 
These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. The very practical question before us this Lord's Day is simply this. How do you know that you know God? What biblical evidences can you produce that would assure your own heart that you truly know Christ? In 1 John chapter 2, the Apostle John speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sets forth three tests by which to evaluate the authenticity of the profession, I know God. What tests, parents, what tests would you give to your children should they ask you, how can I know that I know God? Many of us might be inclined to help our children perhaps to recall a prayer they had uttered in the past confessing their sin, confessing faith in Jesus Christ. Or perhaps we might also remind them of some step of faith of, or a step of obedience on their part that they had demonstrated in the past, such as memorizing Bible passages or, or catechism memorization or their willingness to share their faith with others, or the fact that they've been baptized with water. Now, though it is important to mark out past spiritual milestones for our children, it is not in the context, listen very closely, it is not in the context of the past that John's three tests are to be applied. It is in the context of the present that the three following tests are to be applied in your life as well as in the life of your children. The first test that John gives, and we'll be looking at these three tests over the next few weeks. We'll only get to cover the first test this Lord's Day. But these are the three tests that John gives. The first one is the test of present Obedience, verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2. The second test is the test of present love, in verses 7 through 11, love for the brethren. The third test is the test of present belief, in verses 18 through 27. Now, John isn't saying... You can know that you know God if at one time you can remember that you were obedient to God in the past. See, that's not the test. Or that you can remember some time when you actually loved a Christian. Or that you actually believed at one time the, the doctrinal truths that are essential to the Christian faith. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about present tests. Let me ask a different kind of question. How do you know that you are physically alive right where you sit today? Is it the testimony of your mother that she actually gave birth to you? Or the fact that you can produce some document that says you were actually born, a birth certificate? Is that how you know you're alive today where you sit? 
Dear ones, the best test, obviously, that you are alive is the test you can perform right where you're sitting. Are you breathing? Are you thinking? Is your heart beating? Do you have a pulse? You see, what people said about you 10 years ago, yeah, I remember he used to be alive. Or whether or not you have a birth certificate has nothing to do with your being alive today, where you sit. Dear ones, you know how to take your pulse to assure yourself of physical life, but do you know how to take your spiritual pulse? Do you run in fear from even trying to take your spiritual pulse? Do you worry? Do you become an anxious when I talk about the subject of taking your spiritual pulse? The Apostle John gives you three tests that together will determine your spiritual pulse and that will assure your heart before God. You see, that's the goal. The goal is to assure your heart before God, if you know God. To assure your heart before God that you are indeed alive to God and know Him. See, 1 John 5.13 says this, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. God wants you to have assurance that you have eternal life. Because you see, that assurance, according to 1 John 5.13, actually is an incentive to continue to believe in Jesus Christ. When you have to continue to go back to square one in your Christian life, am I a Christian? Do I know God? You're not going to be growing in your Christian life. Well, you say, well, what if there is no pulse? I take the three tests and I don't find a spiritual pulse. Or what if it's so weak I can barely tell that it's there? Well, you need to know that as well. You need to be aware of that. And you need to do something about it if that's the case. You need to confess before God your sin. Repent of your sin. Flee to Jesus Christ. And we are assured when we do so, based upon the righteousness and the justness of Jesus Christ, that He will forgive us. You see, the Gnostic false teachers of John's day were promoting an assurance, to be sure. But it was a false assurance. They said, I know that I know God because of the anointing or the spiritual experience I've received from God that has given me a true knowledge of God. This was the Gnostic test of assurance. This is how they would summarize their test of assurance. I know that I know because of my experience. Again, I say to you, as I've said in the past, I'm not opposed at all to rich and meaningful times with God in worship. However, dear ones, our experiences must always be tested by the Word of God. You remember this same apostle, the apostle John, commands his readers then as well as his readers now in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And how do we test the spirits? Well, we have to have an infallible standard to test the spirits. And the only infallible standard that we have is the Word of God. Dear ones, Pernicious and evil is the maxim, seeing is believing. And we've alluded to this in past sermons. Seeing is believing, for we walk not by sight, but by faith in God's word. But equally pernicious and evil is the maxim, experiencing is believing. For we walk not by experience, but by faith 
in the living Word of God as well. You want to find some of the most unstable Christians around. I believe you will find them in this particular category. They are those who are living from one experience to another. And you see, once you get caught into that trap of basing your relationship with God on the basis of your experience, you continue, continuously have to top the last experience. You're not popping pills, you're popping experiences to get a high, to assure yourself that you know God. But that is not the basis upon which you assure your heart before God that you know God, not the mystical, spiritual experiences you have. <clears throat> How much of this vain philosophy has seeped into the practice of so many churches in worship? How many churches today are built upon the idea, their worship services are built upon the idea that if a church can just give its people a real experience, it will keep them coming back for more. Give them an experience and they'll keep coming back for more and more and more. Well, it works. From a pragmatic approach, it does keep people coming back. There's no doubt about it but is entirely unbiblical. <clears throat> you see, the Lord Jesus Christ has not called elders, ministers, to be entertainers. He's called the minister to proclaim faithfully the word of God. I am a herald, a messenger, proclaiming a message to you from God himself. That is my calling. That is my job. And I will be judged on that final day on how faithful I have been in issuing the message. Not how I spiced it up. Not how I made it palatable to the taste buds of you or others, but how faithful I have been to the one who sent me. And dear ones, you as God's people are not an audience anxiously awaiting an entertaining show each Lord's Day. You are worshipers of the Most High God. And you must never, ever forget that. Do not live in your own Christian walk by experience. And do not judge a worship service by certain highs or lows. Listen closely to the Word of God, to the Spirit of God, as He illuminates your mind and your understanding and rejoice in the truth of God. In the passage before us today, dear ones, and I'll be focusing my attention upon verses 3 through 6, the Apostle John, this would be my outline for the sermon today, the Apostle John first gives the test, the test of assurance in verse 3. Second, he presents the claim of the false teachers in verse 4. And third, he directs us to the goal of obedience in verses 5 through 6. So first, the test. Second, the claim. And third, the goal. Let's consider first then the, that first point, the test of assurance. The test of assurance that's given here is that of obedience. <coughs> As I said earlier, this is actually the first of three tests of assurance that John gives in chapter 2. The other tests are to follow 
later on in the chapter. <clears throat> As you consider the test before us, dear ones, before you can even ask the question, how can I know that I know God, you must begin by asking an even more fundamental question, what is it to know God? What is it to know God? Well, let me state first of all what it is not. It is not the same thing as merely knowing something about God. It is certainly possible for people to know many biblical facts about God and yet for God to remain a total stranger to them, to have no relationship with God, to simply know facts about God. For example, I may know certain facts about Premier Ralph Klein. I may know his position on certain issues or his age or his birthplace, his wife's name. I may know certain things about him. But I cannot claim to know him for I have no personal relationship with him at all. However, if you ask me, on the other hand, whether I know Lana Price, I would readily confess, yes, I know not simply facts about her, she's my wife, she's my companion, my friend. I lovingly know her through a personal relationship with her. True knowledge of God, dear ones, begins with learning and acquiring knowledge of God. We must know certain things about God. But it doesn't stop with simply learning facts about God. There must be, as a result of what we learn about God, a relationship, a covenant that's established with God, fellowship with God. I really encourage you as parents to impress that truth upon your children. Encourage them in Bible memorization. Encourage them in catechetical memorization. But do not let them think that the ball stops there. Let them see that their knowledge is only to give to them love and appreciation for who God is and what He's done for them in their life. <clears throat> well, we've looked at what knowing God is not. What is knowing God? To know God, dear ones, is to enjoy life and fellowship with the living God by means of the covenant that he's established with his Son. If you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 2, we will note an example from the scripture of priests of the Most High God. Certainly, if you would expect anyone to know God, you would expect priests to know God, but the sons of Eli, we find, did not know God. Verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And so it is not your... Your position, whether you're an elder, a deacon, a minister, that does not guarantee that you know God. It is not the fact that you were raised in a Christian home that guarantees that you know God. You know God on the basis of enjoying His life and His fellowship, receiving life from Jesus Christ, receiving his forgiveness, walking in fellowship with him. In fact, John, in his gospel, <coughs> chapter 17, verse 3, tells us what it means to know God. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see, to know God is to have eternal life. To have that fellowship with the Lord. To know God, dear ones, is to feed upon His Word as the very Word of life. 
To know God is to embrace Jesus Christ as your life and not simply as a compartment within your life. Not as simply one part of your life, but to embrace Jesus Christ as your life, as your reason, as your purpose for existence. Dear ones, Christ is not an alien or stranger to you who know him, for he is, as we have already learned from 1 John 2 1, he is your advocate. Jesus Christ is your elder brother who comes alongside as an advocate to defend you. You have your own elder brother who defends you as an advocate before the throne of God against all the accusations of the enemy. And this advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not like the elder brother, the prodigal son, who was envious of the father's treatment of the prodigal son and receiving him back into the family, blessing him upon his confession and restoration of God. This advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, your elder brother, comes alongside of you and he rejoices with you and brings you up to the father to confess your sins and says to the father, I died for this one. Forgive him, Father, in my name, for my sake. This is not an elder brother who sulks and stews over the fact that God forgives you, his people. To know God, dear ones, is entirely an act of God's grace. Your knowing Christ as Savior and Advocate is absolutely dependent upon His having first known you. Having known you in love and revealing Himself to you through His Word and His Spirit. That's absolutely essential that you understand that. Your knowing Him is depending upon the fact that He first knew you. In fact... We find in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, this truth made very, very clear. <clears throat> For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he foreknew. This doesn't mean that God simply, like a prophet, looked down the corridors of time and saw who would come to Christ, and he knew them in advance. This is talking about that special sense of knowing somebody, loving someone, before you were even born and created, before God established the foundations of the earth, he foreknew you, he loved you. And on the basis of his love, he predestined you to the adoption of sons. Again, in 1 Peter 1.2, 1 Peter 1.2 teaches a similar truth. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now notice, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And again, some of my Arminian friends and myself included at one time believe that all this was saying that I am elect based upon the fact that God knew in advance that I would choose Christ. That's foreknowledge, according to the Arminian view. Well, that's quite interesting if that's the case because we find the word foreknowledge again used in the same chapter in verse 20, speaking of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the King James Version and the New King James Version use the word foreordained. It's actually the word foreknown. 
For indeed, or he indeed was foreknown, Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Does that mean that God had nothing to do with anything that Jesus Christ did, except that he just knew what Christ was going to, to, to be ha uh, doing in his life? That there was nothing decreed, that there was no love for his son. They were simply aware of what was going to transpire in Christ's life. That contradicts everything the Bible teaches about the, the fact that what Christ accomplished was foreordained. And it was because God loved his son and God loved his people that Christ was foreknown in that manner. Well, that's the same term that's used in 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Dear ones, you would never have come to know God in a million years if he had not chosen in his grace to love you and to reveal himself to you. You would never have come to know him you have wa would have wandered blindlessly or blindly in darkness and confusion in your sin all of your life had the Lord not revealed himself to you. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 11 about the fact of God knowing us, revealing himself to us. Matthew 11, verse 25 <clears throat> At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Dear ones, your knowledge of God is a direct result of God revealing to you himself. It is a miracle, a greater miracle than if someone were to die today and be raised from the dead in our presence. This is a greater miracle when someone is born again. When God reveals himself to someone and they know God. On the last day, the Lord Jesus made it very clear that many on that last day will proclaim to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord. They will cry out, didn't we do all these mighty and wondrous things in your name? And the Lord will say to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. I was never in covenant relationship with you. You knew maybe some facts about me, but you were not in covenant relationship with me. I never, ever knew you. Not that I knew you at one point in time, and now I do not know you, but I have never known you. As we continue through this first point, <clears throat> this test, now we know what it means to know God to be in covenant relationship with him, to derive life from him, just as a branch derives life from a vine, or this arm derives life connected to the body, but sever the arm and the uh, sever, sever the arm from the body, and the arm will wither. We are in union with Jesus Christ. We derive life from him. <clears throat> now, how do you know? The question comes, how do you know that you know God? Well, here's the test. If we keep his commandments. You see, in the first chapter of 1 John, you are simply told, or not simply, but you are told to refrain from 
sin. But here you are given a positive command to obey his commandments. You're not simply to follow something negative just to avoid sin. You are to positively go out and keep his commandments. Dear ones, to know God, according to this test, to know God is to obey God. To know God is to love God and to obey God. I think Calvin correctly remarks when he says, quote, the knowledge of God is efficacious. The knowledge of God is efficacious. That is, the knowledge of God affects change in the heart, in the mind, in the words, and in the actions of those who know God. You cannot remain the same if you know God. There will be changes in your life. To know God is to find, dear ones, great delight in God's commandments. To know God is not to consider God's commandments a great cross that we're called to bear, a great burden that God has laid upon us. Oh, we have to obey God's commandments. You see, those who know God delight in his commandments. And we find that taught in many, many passages in the scripture. You know, James chapter 1 says, calls God's law the perfect law of liberty, not the perfect law of bondage. <clears throat> The Lord Jesus says to take his yoke upon yourself, for his yoke is light. His burden is light. His yoke is easy. Psalm 119, David certainly tells us very clearly that we are to delight in God's commandments. Verses 35 and 47, listen to what David says. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Verse 47, I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. See, this is the attitude of those who know God. <coughs> Loving obedience to God's commandments, not simply the commandments in the New Testament, but God's commandments. It doesn't qualify them in any way. All of God's commandments. Loving obedience to God's commandments is not evidence of legalism, but rather it's evidence, according to the scripture, of one who knows God. <clears throat> Antinomians, those who minimize our duty to obey God's law, are always more comfortable with the phrase or the cliche, the spirit of the law, rather than the cliché, the letter of the law. However, let me ask you, did Jesus Christ merely keep the spirit of the law? Was Christ, we know the answer to that is obviously no, he didn't simply keep the spirit of the law, he kept the letter of the law. Was Jesus Christ a legalist? Absolutely not. He was obedient. He demonstrated his love for God through his obedience, his knowledge of God through his obedience. Well, according to 1 John 2, 6, you are to walk just as Christ walked. Dear ones, loving obedience to God's command is not legalism. For you realize that no act of obedience that you could perform would in any way win or merit the favor or approval of God. True obedience to God's commandments is motivated from a heart of love for God because he has won your salvation through the perfect obedience of Christ. We do believe in a salvation by works, but it is a salvation that is based upon the work and the obedience of Jesus Christ and not upon our works of obedience. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, is this speaking of some kind of sinless perfection? Is keeping God's commandments sinless obedience? No, for that would uh, contradict everything that John has already stated in chapter 1 about our need for forgiveness. That we're to continuously come before God seeking his forgiveness. Well, what is it again? What does it mean to keep God's commandments then? That may seem like a very simple phrase, but I want to just very briefly expound what it means to keep God's commandments. Well, to keep God's commandments begins with loving those commandments in your heart rather than despising those commandments. That's where it must begin, in your heart. Loving God's commandments. If you don't even have that in your heart, then certainly you must fall upon your face before God and ask and plead with God to give you delight and love for his commandments. That's where it begins. Now, to say that we're to delight and to love God's commandments doesn't mean that <clears throat> to apply God's commandments to our life is effortless. That it's not painful. It is painful to apply the commandments of God to our life. It will hurt you see the old man, those sinful patterns and habits, they don't die easy. They don't want to go away. And so when we apply the word of God by the spirit of God to our lives, yeah, it is going to be painful. You're going to hear a lot of crying out in pain, a lot of ouches. But that is what the word of God is to do. It is to kill and to crucify the old man. <clears throat> Second of all, keeping God's commands, dear ones, is growing in obedience to God's will. <clears throat> growing. I want to emphasize that word. It is growing in obedience to God's will rather than stagnating in obedience to God's will. <clears throat> I can tell you, because I've been there myself, that if you find it difficult to apply this particular sermon to your life today, it's probably because the fact that rather than growing, you're stagnating. You see, we don't want to take this kind of a test of obedience while we're stagnating. But I encourage you, continue to apply the Word of God. Apply the test. Plead for God's mercy. Turn from your sin and follow Him. It is a process, dear ones, of sanctification that God is working in your life. That is keeping God's commandments. Not sinless perfection, but growing in obedience. As God gives you light and understanding concerning something, what is the attitude of one who knows God? I want to walk in that light. And as you walk in that light, God gives you more light. As you are faithful with the light that you have, God gives you more light and understanding. And then those who know God will walk in that light and understanding. And God adds more light and more understanding. That's sanctification. It is a process. You are growing. <clears throat> Thirdly, keeping God's commandments, dear ones, is fighting and I mean fighting against sins, temptation, rather than rolling over and playing dead. It is confessing sin. You are keeping God's commandments. When you confess sin, when you repent of it, when re you renew your covenant vows to follow Christ, if you have fallen away, that is keeping God's commandments. 
You know, Paul had a particular struggle with one sin in his life that he specifically, I believe, enumerates. <coughs> in Romans chapter 7, it was the sin of covetousness, the sin of envy, which is, according to Paul, idolatry. It was a breaking of one of those commandments of God that God gave to Moses, not to covet. And yet Paul struggled and wrestled with that sin. Now, I can guarantee you, and you can see in the chapter, Romans chapter 7, Paul did not roll over and play dead when it came to that sin. There was a struggle inside. There was wrestling inside. There was fighting inside. But he continued to wage war against that sin. Those who know God keep God's commandments by striving with sin, wrestling with it. They don't give in. <clears throat> Again, just to quote something that... Uh, Calvin notes concerning this very concept. Calvin says, Those who truly keep God's commandments are they who, quote, strive according to the capacity of human weakness to form their life in conformity to the will of God. Recognizing the weakness of man, they continue to strive to conform their lives according to the will of God. Not sinless obedience, continual striving. And sometimes, dear ones, that's all it seems like we're doing is striving and striving. But God grants victory. God gives us victory as we continue to strive to apply his grace. How do you know that you know Christ? Are you keeping his commandments? Not did you at one time keep his commandments, but are you presently keeping his commandments? Now, the claim of the false teachers, and we'll go through these very quickly, the last two points. The claim of the false teachers, secondly. <clears throat> Actions speak louder than words. So the wise old maxim goes. Dear ones, your actions and words give a clear indication of the real person within. Your actions and words, according to the scripture, are like a clear window into the soul. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. In other words, an orange tree is going to produce oranges and not apples. You will be able to tell what kind of a tree it is by the kind of fruit that is on the tree. The nature of the tree is revealed by the fruit of the tree, just as the nature of a man is revealed by the fruit that that man bears. He says... <coughs> Later on, in the next verse, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, our words are a window to our soul. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. What you say when you're with others reveals something about you inside. Not simply when you're around the fellow Christians, but when you're with your non-Christian friends. Your words, your actions, reveal something about you to them. They're gleaning, they're formulating something about you. What are they formulating? What are they believing? What conclusions are they coming to about you? That is why one of the most important qualifications uh, for being an elder, a ruler in the church, is not simply a man's profession of faith profession of an inward call. I've been called to serve as an elder in the church. Many make that claim. But the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. One of those very objective and observable standards that we're to apply to an elder 
How does he rule his family? Does he rule his family? Loving leadership? Is his wife submissive? Are his children obedient? Or is everything in chaos in his family? First test that we are applying today <clears throat> is an objective test of obedience, not a subjective test of mere profession or mystical experiences. Dear ones, to know God is, as I've said, to obey God. <clears throat> John declares that professing that a professing Christian who does not keep God's commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now there may be those who seem to be sincere. They may seem to to say, I really believe that I know God by my experience. But they're sincerely wrong. It's not on the basis of your experience that you know God. John does not give that as a test. The objective test is that of your obedience. A person who believes that is self-deceived, and John says he's a liar. For faith without works is dead faith. And without faith, it's impossible to know God or to please God. The third point that John makes in this passage is found in verses 5 through 6. And it is the goal of obedience. The goal of obedience. <clears throat> but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In this passage, actually, John cites two goals of your obedience in keeping God's word. The first goal is that obedience perfects or completes your love for God. Obedience, let me say it again, perfects or completes your love for God. That's in 5a. And the second goal that is presented here by John is that obedience conforms you to the image of Christ. You walk as Christ walked. The first goal, obedience perfects or completes your love for God. Just as faith without works is dead, dear ones, so love without obedience is dead love. It's incomplete. Someone who simply speaks of love but does not exercise love through obedience does not know what true love is. They do not know God simply to speak of, God, uh, speak of knowing God and loving. Love does begin in the heart, but if it doesn't issue in obedience, God's word is not genuine love. If it does not issue in obedience to God's word, it's not genuine love. Now, very, very quickly, let me simply summarize for you what love is. True love, dear ones, selflessly gives to the one who is loved. Two points under this uh, uh, question, what is true love? True love selflessly gives to the one who is loved. The one who truly loves is not in the attitude of give me, give me, give me. I need, I need, I need. I want, I want, I want. I take, I take, I take. That's not true love. That's not genuine love, biblical love. Listen closely to what true love is in these biblical references. Listen closely to what it says love is. For God so loved <coughs> the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son. John 3.35 The father loves the son and has 
given all things into his hand. Galatians 2.20. Paul says, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 <clears throat> Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. You see, love is demonstrated by an attitude of giving is not giving to the one loved what he always wants or what he always desires, but giving to the one loved what is right. And that brings us to the second aspect of what is genuine love. True love always keeps God's commandments. True love keeps God's commandments. 1 John 5.3 For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. <clears throat> True love, dear ones, is not some mere feeling that you have toward another. It is a commitment to do what is right and what is lawful toward that person. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity and transgression of God's law. According to 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love rejoices in the truth. Most of the time, I'm afraid, there is nothing further from true love than this romantic notion of love. And I think that it must be purged from the church for us to regain the ground and understand again what true love is. Certainly within the marital relationship, there is a place for romantic love. But even in that situation, it's not the definition of romantic love that we find in the world. Romantic love is usually another word simply for selfishness. Romantic love is usually another way of saying, you make me feel good, and I want you. Rather than give, 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 according to the commandments of God. A couple came to me for premarital counseling <coughs> in my last pastorate, they were not members of my church. They had been visiting. Both professed to be Christians and both seemed to understand the nature of the gospel. Both professed faith in Christ. Both seemed to understand the nature of grace. But then I asked them a question about their present living arrangements. And were they keeping themselves pure? And that is where it seems like everything began to break down. They were living together. The man acknowledged his behavior to be sinful, but yet maintained his love for God and this woman at the same time. I took him to the passage we've read today, 1 John 2, 4, where God says that the person who doesn't keep his commandments and says he knows God is a liar. He's deceiving himself. He's a liar. I told him, you're not giving that's what love does. You're not giving, you're taking. You're taking what does not rightfully belong to you. See, John does not understand 
in this passage perfect love to mean sinless love, but rather love that reaches its completion, its goal of obedience. We could say instead of perfect love, per complete love. Not sinless love, but complete love. In heaven you will have sinless love, but not until then. The second goal of obedience that is mentioned by the Apostle John is conformity to the image of Christ. In 1 John 2, 5b, it says in verse 6, by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In order that you do not lose hope <clears throat> through this very painful process at times of sanctification, it's always, dear ones, always important that you ever keep before you the goal, this goal, that you are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There's a purpose. There's a reason for what you're going through. God is molding and shaping and chipping off the rough edges. He is conforming you to the image of Christ. And Christ himself learned obedience through the things that he suffered, the scripture teaches us. If Christ can learn obedience through the things that he suffered, how much more we can learn obedience because we have so much more to learn. He learned it by becoming a man, not because he was sinful and had to learn, but because as God and taking on human flesh, he was now able to experience temptation and to knew what it was to be tempted. He knew what it was to suffer in a body, and he learned even through that obedience to God. Entire sanctification will occur, dear ones, but it won't occur until the second coming of Christ. But that process of sanctification and molding and shaping us into the image of Christ has already begun. In Acts 4.13, as I close, we find these words, Acts 4.13, concerning the apostles. <clears throat> you remember in this case, Peter and John had been arrested for preaching the truth. They were brought before the Sanhedrin, and they were told not to preach in the name of Christ. But they observed now, it says in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. Now this pertains specifically to their wisdom, their boldness and what they declared. But I wonder, as we make the application broader to people as they look at our lives, know that we have been with Jesus? Do they see those Christ-like qualities within us, particularly beginning in our own family? There's where we can begin. That's where we'll get an honest evaluation. Your wife, your husband, your children. Can they say, this man, this woman has been with Jesus from what they see? How do you know that you know God? By your experience? By your feelings? God forbid. You know that you know God by your obedience to God's commandments. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you in the name of Christ and we thank you that you have shown us mercy, giving us knowledge of God. And you have given to us a true knowledge, for it is based upon your word. It is not based upon our human speculation. It is not based upon what some mere men have said. It is based upon the infallible, authoritative word of God. We praise you, our God, 
that you have as well given to us who know you, the desire to obey you, to walk in obedience to your commandments. O oh Lord, we pray that this would bring great assurance in our heart today. And that, Father, if there is not assurance at this point in our lives, if it is due to sin in our life, if it is due to the fact that we have not been walking in obedience to your commandments, that, Lord, you would grip our hearts even now, that you would bring us to a brokenness in our own heart, that we would cry out to you and turn from our sins and receive your forgiveness, which is so free and abundant in Christ, and that we would renew our covenant and follow you, take up our cross and follow you. Lord, we pray that you would bless now as we begin uh, this time of celebrating the Lord's Supper as well, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would strengthen our resolve to follow Christ, to obey him. For Christ's sake, amen. <clears throat>